Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Apologies for the lack of video last Monday, I was preoccupied with my 7 days of Kerbal Videothon, but now we're back to normal. We have lots to discuss this week from lots of Starship news, Artemis 2's core stage nears completion, RS-25 fires to 111% power, China was a hive of launch activity, the Blunderbirds, I mean Roscosmos, launched the MS-23 rescue mission to the International Space Station, we prepare for a day of Falcon 9 frenziness, and KSP-2 came lithobraking onto Steam. All of this and more in store, let's begin with Starship news. We kick things off with a record-breaking Raptor engine fire test at the SpaceX McGregor test facility. The Raptor engine fired for a total of 194 seconds, which is the longest ever vertical Raptor engine test in the tripod, made possible thanks to the addition of some larger fuel tanks at the tripod test stand. Over at the Starbase launch site, the mysterious, flapless Ship 26 began its test campaign on test stand A on Tuesday with a round of cryoproofing. These tests use liquid nitrogen rather than methane or oxygen, and as you can see from the frost line there, the nitrogen was loaded into the liquid oxygen tank first, and then we saw some further loading into the liquid methane tank, though to a lesser extent. Detanking began not long after. Yeah, Ship 26 is a weird one. Nobody is quite sure why it's not spawned to get any flaps or heat shielding, so we're all super curious to see what it's going to be used for. In all likelihood, this is a prototype orbital fuel depot designed to test and demonstrate orbital refueling systems, which is a vital requirement for NASA's Artemis moon landing missions. That and Ship 27, which is just as flapless and tireless as Ship 26, and now fully stacked. On Wednesday last week, we saw Ship 27 reach full height in the high bay. The Starlink loader was rolled out of its garage last week. This device is used to load Starlink V2 satellites into the Starship Pez dispenser, first seen with Ship 24. We're not sure why it's being rolled out here yet. Perhaps SpaceX want to start loading up one of their vehicles, or maybe they want to work on the Starlink loader itself. With all the excitement of static fires at the launch site over the month of February, we were all really hoping to see some static fire testing from Ship 25. So far, the only tests that this vehicle has undergone at the launch area are some flap actuation tests. But then on Thursday, it was lifted off suborbital pad B and moved out of the launch site. A lot of people were curious about why this was. Could it be being scrapped in view of being outdated? Or perhaps it's being moved elsewhere for temporary storage? Either way, it was sent to the ring yard, not the rocket garden, which is the usual final destination for scrapped prototypes, and then overnight on Saturday it was rolled out of the ring yard and relocated to the Macy's test site, which has recently received infrastructure to facilitate cryotesting, so Ship 25 has almost certainly been moved here to begin its cryoproofing campaign. Nick Antoidi captured some great shots of the mounting of further shielding to the outside of the orbital launch mount, as well as the installation of a new cover on the booster quick disconnect arm. The Artemis 1 launch was so cool, and we're getting closer and closer to Artemis 2. Last week, technicians at NASA's Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans moved the engine section of the SLS rocket for the Artemis 2 mission into position for final joining to the core stage. The engine section contains, get ready for this, the engines, and it's the last of the five major elements needed to connect the stage into one major structure. In addition to the four RS-25 engines, the engine stage contains miles of cabling and hundreds of sensors, and it acts as a crucial attachment point for the two giant solid rocket boosters. Over the next few weeks, the teams will join the engine section to the core stage, and after this is complete, technicians will begin to add each of the four RS-25 engines one by one to complete the stage. Once completely assembled with its four engines, the core stage will then be shipped to the Kennedy Space Center for stacking in the vehicle assembly building. On the subject of SLS, we saw another RS-25 engine test last week. This was a 600 second test with the engine operating at up to 111% power level. The engine itself is the newly redesigned RS-25 that will enter service powering the core stage of the Artemis V mission. The tests seem to go well and we didn't expect to see 10 more tests of this new RS-25 engine model. We had a couple of launches from China last week. On Wednesday, we saw the launch of a Long March 3BE from the Zichang launch complex, which carried the ChinaSat-26 satellite to geosynchronous orbit. 
This was for China Satcom, a China aerospace company that provides services via satellites and a former subsidiary of the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation. According to official sources, the ChinaSat-26 is China's first high-throughput satellite with a capacity of more than 100 gigabits per second. The second Chinese launch was on Friday. This was a Long March 2C, which carried the Horus-1 satellite to low Earth orbit. This satellite was built by the Egyptian Space Agency and is named after the ancient Egyptian god Horus, who is believed to be the god of war and the sky, and this satellite will be used for Earth observation. Remember the Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft that ended up having a coolant leak that left its crew stranded on the International Space Station? Well, last week on Friday, Roscosmos launched an uncrewed replacement for the MS-22, the MS-23, which blasted off into the dark skies over the Baikonur Cosmodrome. A couple of days after launch, the spacecraft autonomously docked with the Poisk module of the International Space Station, bringing provisions to the crew of the station, and of course it will also serve as the return vehicle for Roscosmos cosmonaut Sergei Prokopiev, Dmitry Patelin, and NASA astronaut Frank Rubio. I don't know if you guys know about this, but there's this video game called Kerbal Space Program that came out some years ago now. I've covered it somewhat on this channel before, and of course, on Friday, Kerbal Space Program 2 released into early access. This is, of course, news to absolutely nobody watching this video, I'm sure. And last week, my channel did a full-on Kerbothon. One full-length KSP2 video every single day for seven days, with a couple of shorts thrown in there as well. So far, I've been having lots of fun with the game. We did an Apollo-style Mun landing, built and flew an SSTO, messed around with Juno Rovers and the Bridge Challenge, talked with Nate and Chris about the future of colonies and multiplayer, launched the KSC into orbit on a live stream, flew a space shuttle, and most recently visited the Golden Monarch. It was one heck of a week, and going forward, don't worry, I'm going to taper down the number of videos I spam you all with, but I hope you enjoyed the ride. And yeah, you know, KSP2 has had a bit of a rough launch, the system requirements are pretty demanding, and it didn't run great on my PC, which has an RTX 4090 GPU and a 5950X CPU, so you really can't get much more powerful than that. I'm confident though that the devs will take everyone's feedback on board and get to work on helping this game realise its full potential. On the subject of Kerbal Space Program, if you've played the original or the sequel, then you're probably aware of the inflatable heat shield, a super useful part that so far doesn't really have an operational real-life counterpart. Well, last week NASA released this time-lapse of the lofted re-entry vehicle stacking and matchmating. Lofted stands for Low Earth Orbit Flight Test of an Inflatable Decelerator, i.e. an inflatable heat shield, and in this footage we can see engineers stack the forward, mid, and aft segments of the flight re-entry vehicle for the lofted heat shield, a technology that could one day help humans land on Mars. The re-entry vehicle's forward segment connects the inflatable heat shield to the inflation system, the mid segment contains the interface to the United Launch Alliance rocket, along with critical power, control, and data acquisition electronics, and the aft section houses the ejector data recorder, cameras, and the parachute system. The SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket with Dragon spacecraft Endeavour is now vertical at Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. This is in preparation for NASA's SpaceX Crew-6 mission, which will be launching today, the 27th of February. In fact, if there are no delays, then this will have already launched for you guys, or is just about to. The expected launch time is roughly the same as the time I plan to publish this video, so you guys will know this one better than me. Today is actually a pretty crazy one, as we're expecting to see two Falcon 9 Starlink launches today as well. Three Falcon 9s in a single 24-hour span is pretty incredible. I'll be sure to cover all of these launches in full in next week's episode of Space This Week, so make sure you've subscribed so that you get notified of that video when it's up. And hey, if you want to help support what I do here, then you can sign up to my Patreon page or my channel membership program, just like the lovely folks scrolling on the left did, to get early access to some videos and help make all of this possible. Otherwise, there are two videos on screen right now for you to check out. Don't know what they are, YouTube picks them specifically for you, though I am guessing at least one of them is a KSP video. <laughs> anyway, thank you all so much for watching today's episode of Space This Week, and of course, the KSB2 videos I've been pushing out for the last seven days, and I'll catch you all on the next flight.